thank you very much for having me this afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. And this was conducted as part of my PhD thesis. Part of the reason I was interested is because people talk about damage to the lead tanks, but not go into any specific detail. And as I'm going to show over the course of my presentation here, when we actually delve down into the types of fragmentation occurring with these artifacts, some very, very interesting features turns up, not just in the way they're dismantled, but also not just the way they're dismantled, but also the context that are chosen for dismantling and the way they're buried that is suggesting some very targeted, deliberate destruction of these artifacts. So, yeah. My main aim to this, of course, to talk about the patterns that are potentially available with the social value well, of these tags, their communities, show the importance partly through the decoration of them, because a lot of the times when we see the fragments, the decoration survives intact, and it stands out as quite a stark feature. Part of that as well would be the complete or fragmented states of these artifacts, and then thinking about how I might relate this to, say, why the social patterns of artifact deposition. We've had talks of bronze and Iron Age cauldrons, which are very similar artifacts in scale, size, and potential social value to these communities, which the tanks compare to in a lot of ways, which I'm going to try and get through in this talk. So the lead tanks. As of, now, as of my current research, there are now 63, potentially 64, across the UK. Is the map visible? So that's good. So we can see that there's a slight cluster in the southwest a little bit in the southeast, but the greatest concentration heads up in a curve towards the East Midlands, towards North Yorkshire. And this makes it quite interesting for thinking, why are these artifacts here? But also, why are they not here? If there's, I mean, for instance, County Durham in the northeast is particularly missing these. The northwest has very few examples. The West Midlands, for instance, all of which are very lead-rich areas but are noticeably missing artifacts that require quite a large amount of lead to create. And you think, well, why are these areas that have the necessary resources to build these things missing examples? It could be that we haven't found any. It could be that they could be destroyed. It could be that they were never there in the first place. And that's partly what I've been thinking about over the course of my research, part of which has been how they got there. So as you can see, most of them are just under two kilometers from the nearest river. They're less than 10 kilometers from the nearest road, but they're over 60 kilometers from the nearest lead mine, all of which was important for me thinking, why have you put them here? And here we get to the artifacts. So when I called them composite artifacts, I was thinking of a number of regions. They're very large artifacts. The size automatically sticks out to you. And there's a number of features that mix in as well. They're three sheets of lead for the Roman ones. So it coincidentally one sheet for the base and two to form the sides, whereas their later predecessors are only one sheet for the base and one sheet for the sides. So something is happening that these artifacts are kind of shrinking down. And I always feel very sorry for the Anglo-Saxon ones because everyone mentions that they're very poorly made, that they're very shoddy compared to the Roman ones. The Roman ones always noted that they can hold water, they're very robust, whereas their later counterparts, they're often very weak, they can't really stand up. It's that they can't hold water. So everyone thinks, well, are they for holding grain or have they got another kind of function? But part of that as well is both sets have their iron handles around the top that frequently note that if you actually try to put any pressure on them, try to carry them, they would twist straight off. So what is that for? It's almost that composite artifact that you're mixing two different types of metal, but also the decorative features as well. So you've got a potential industrial or functional use, but also these things are clearly meant to be viewed. It's a shame you can't get a good view because there's also tri -row monograms around the back of this one. But the way it's set up in the British Museum, you could only see it at the front. So you don't really get a sense of, is this meant to be viewed on all sides? And how, it, and how is it meant to be viewed by its potential communities? So these are very decorative artifacts that the types of decorations fit within a much broader pattern across Roman Britain, potentially across later early medieval. England. We've got the chi Rome monogram, which is always used to identify as potentially Christian artifacts for a baptism vessel. But incidentally, less than a third of them, only nine of them have this monogram, which interests me because if these are supposedly religious artifacts, why have you got this decoration? I mean, we know that the chi Rome monogram is also coincidentally linked to the emperor so could it be that this might have an imperial function? But if it's an imperial function, 
why is it a tiny village in Suffolk or in Nottinghamshire far from any real habitation? habitation? Other than one spot, the St Andrew's Cross has been used as a potential religious iconography, but this is also something that appears heavily on coffins at the time, such as the famous Spitalfield Market complex, Spitalfield Market coffin found in London. Likewise, we get this supposed chevron design and this herringbone design, all of which were meant to show that even if they're not all decorated in the monogram, they're all showing a very similar styles of decorative features, which makes us wonder, are they all coming from the same workshop? And is there a specific pattern? Like, there's variations, but a lot of them do follow the same decorative schemes together. And it's now that I'd like to come to this, the complete versus fragmented value-driven behaviour. So when you put them side by side, it really sticks out what is going on. I mean, these are large objects. The Roman ones are believed to hold between 20 to 320 litres in volume. So these are a very large, very impressive object. The Anglo-Saxon ones aren't as big, but these still stand out. And when you see them fragmented like this, with, say, panels like the North Lincoln one that's been that looks as like it's been torn off the side of these artefacts, someone is putting a lot of time and effort into doing this, especially if this is an inscribed, this is an inscribed piece. You'd think, why would you not take it with you? Why have you left this behind? But why do you want to leave this? Like, wouldn't this matter to you? I mean... Some of them have been interestingly decorated with the phrase Utene Felix, luck to the user, but it's been misspelled, which has made us think again, is this the same artifact? And if that's so, why are you leaving a transcribed or inscribed large piece of lead sheet lying in a field somewhere? Why would you not want to bring it with you? And this is particularly what I was most interested about. Like when people talked about the damage, they hadn't gone into the damage that was being done to these tanks. And I was really interested in this because when we look at the damage between the two, there's some interesting factors. Both of them, there's, a re there's an almost complete amount of complete tanks being found. But when we look at the deliberately fragmented or damaged ones, there's many more Roman tanks that are found deliberately damaged than their later predecessors. It could be that there's almost twice as many Roman tanks as their later counterparts. But there seems to be almost a real targeted effort to destroy these. In the 80s, when the big monograms on Christianity were coming into Britain, the damage was always attributed to the apparent pagan revival under Julian the Apostate. And this was seen as deliberately targeted revenge. But as I will show, some of the fragments that have been decorated have this Chiro monogram on them. So if this is about damaging and destroying a potentially religious sect, why are you leaving the symbol associated with this religious sect intact on these fragments? And I wanted to bring up the deliberately damaged bit because we've mentioned human error. Some of these unfortunately have been damaged in the process of finding either through mechanical excavators or were damaged through environmental factors such as one of them contained, one of them contained a pit in Trowbridge in, in Somerset was found in a clay pit near a river and this had been broken itself, but later environmental factors due to the pit flooding and the clay started to shift had caused further cracks and further damage in these tanks. So I was particularly interested to see why they were deliberately damaged. And I wish I'd actually done a graph on this because the types of damage are just fascinating. Like you get, sorry, Helen works with Mola and a recent tank from the Walbrook Well came out where the surface of the tank had been scoured with a knife before being hacked to pieces by a heavily bladed artifact, and part of it had even been burnt. And this really said to me, what, sorry, that sounds so pretentious. It just really said, why are you so desperate to destroy these things and then bury it, you know, six layers down a well that's associated with a Near Eastern cult when these are supposedly Christian artifacts? I mean, we often tie Christianity and Mithraism together and they have similar features and similar kind of links. But then you think, why is a fragment of this in a well associated with Mithraism? Other types, for instance, that I'm going to show have been found to either been attacked by a heated object, like a heated poker, and then twisted and torn apart, or similar bladed artifacts. So again, someone really wants to destroy these artifacts and almost remove them from existence. And when I was looking between the context, so we find them in a lot of, say, different varied wet and dry context. 
again, I was looking for evidence of damage. So one of them was wells. The top one at Ashton was crumpled in, but not as damaged. Whereas we get the one from Caversham where the left side of it has basically been burnt away before being placed at the bottom of the well. And as I mentioned with the molar one, again, very targeted evidence. Whereas a lot of the tanks found in rivers were found completely intact with the exception of the two later early medieval ones where they'd been broken in such a way before being tossed into a river that made me think, why is there so much variation going on in this? And the material finds as well were quite interesting that were showing really concentrated effort to get rid of these artifacts. The Ashton tank was found buried under three and a half meters of limestone, along with artifacts that might suggest a termination ritual, pottery, leather shoes, animal bones, the Molar one had plenty of metalwork in it, so did the Cavisham one. They both had similar kind of horse gear, metalwork such as weapons. And even at the bottom of the Molar ta tank, there were six cattle skulls in place that we've used as termination rituals. Same for the variety in the dry... In the dry many of these were found in pits and ditches. And as we can see, some very concentrated effort has gone into destroying them. Most of them are just a single fragment or a single panel. But the one at Corby in Nottinghamshire from Cottinghamshire, you could almost fully reconstruct the thing because so many ta fragments have been deliberately left together. So it makes you wonder, are people taking these fragments with them as perhaps a last goodbye to these places? Or is something else going on in community memory? And as we can see, the one I was talking about from Trowbridge, a lot of the fragments have been kind of folded in together, but left together... The one I'd shown from Preswood in Wiltshire, it was three fragments individually fold apart, but then all folded and rolled up together in the same field with one another. And likewise, the Perios tanks had been twisted in and ripped apart in a similar manner to, say, finds such as pits in Colchester, which had shown lead, lead roofing from a church, which had shown very similar thing. This was also very heavily lifted off and deliberately dismantled. So we can kind of see a much broader pattern of destruction occurring in these features. And this was what I was really interested in. Pinham and Rushton in Northamptonshire, they had been deliberately placed. So you had the ditch where the side and the base had been ripped apart and placed in two groups lying across this ditch, or was it to make a statement? I mean, we always think of ditches as associated with movement and boundaries with certain groups. This ditch at Pindon was part of a multiple Iron Age, Roman, and then later Anglo-Saxon period. So we could almost wonder, is another group coming in, dismantling this feature and laying claim to the area? Or is it a final goodbye for the original inhabitants before they leave this area and decide, is this not worth taking? I mean, in fragments like this, it's always believed to be scrap. It's always as if it's not worth keeping with them. But why would you go to so much effort to dismantle it and lay it out across the bottom of a ditch like this? And then we now get to my final bit where I've really enjoyed comparing them with the bronze cauldrons. These also have a social function as well. If we believe literature, these are always, these are always believed as community feasting cauldrons in a similar way to the idea that a baptism might bring a group together. So if we're comparing them, these might be, these might be artifacts that hold so co social cohesion for a group and might bring people together for certain events. And these also stand out as well. They're very similar. They're three sheets of bronze. So they're similar constructions. They catch the eye. But we can see similar pattern. Helen was showing a lot of Iron Age cauldrons that Jody Jorah are also similarly dismantled. And we can see this as well with the Bronze Age cauldrons, such as the bottom. So we can kind of fit, yeah. So we can kind of fit in some ways our patterns of fragmentation into preceding ideas and then proceeding ideas. Even though there's a different artifact, we can almost see similar, similar care and similar attempts to dismantle these large, very visually striking artifacts that might have been at the center of a community. But then people have then taken the care to get rid of them. And it makes you wonder, has the community, we're talking about fragmentation of communities. Could it be that the community is fragmented and they've left? So this could, this, could this be a last statement of the community drifting apart? I mean, the Periox one was found just on the edge of a settlement in a watering hole and it had hazel oak, it had hazel, sorry, hazel ropes that had been used to drag the tank into place out of the settlement. So again, is it a last goodbye before people are leaving these places? So. As I've seen, 
A lot of the social value attributed to these artifacts is through their large construction, their decoration, and the state upon burial. And I really think the choice of like, not just where they're being buried and the state upon their burial is particularly key for the artifacts. And I would like to go into further detail with this, particularly with the fragmentation theory and the size of the fragments, considering how variable they are. And as I said, we can see a large degree of overlap, not just in preceding patterns, but proceeding patterns and people almost choosing the same features and same ways to dismantle these artifacts and get rid of them. Thank you very much and thank you for this. It was a pleasure. Yeah.